Welcome and thank you for joining the NEHA National Webinar Series. Today, we will be discussing on-site wastewater treatment. This is the first of a two-part series presented by the National On-Site Wastewater Recycling Association, NAURA. Our presenters will provide you with an overview of sewage disposal systems, and we'll discuss the basic types of on-site wastewater treatment and dispersal methods, showcase a new free homeowners educational tool, and present additional resources and training opportunities. I'm Christy Denbrock, Chief Learning Officer at NEHA, and I will be your moderator. Our presenters today are Tom Groves, Tom is the executive director of NAURA, where he oversees all activities, including conference, technical, and education programs. Prior to NAURA, Tom served as the director of wastewater and on-site programs for the New England Interstate Water Pollution Control Commission. Also, Dr. Gary Hawkins. Dr. Hawkins works for the University of Georgia as the Water Resource Management Specialist in the Crop and Soil Science Department and is an Associate Professor. As an Agricultural Engineer, he is responsible for extension programming in the areas of water quality, water quantity, and water resources. Gary is on the NARA Board of Directors and serves as the Chair of the Education Committee. And Dr. Andrew Lazur, Dr. Lazur is a statewide water quality specialist with the University of Maryland Extension, focusing on drinking water quality, private wells, groundwater protection, septic systems, and pond management education. He has been involved in various aspects of water quality in research and extension for 35 years. And he serves as a vice chair of the NARA's Education Committee. We ask that you please write your questions into the chat box, which allows for all attendees to see each question. And if you are not a NEHA member and enjoyed this session, we invite you to become one at NEHA.org. Gentlemen, we have a lot of ground to cover today. Would you like to begin? Yes, thank you, Christy. And let me share. Hey, Tom, you did say the PowerPoint presentation will be available and we'll be able to send that to our attendees. Yes, thank you. Yep, thank you. Well, I'm glad we're able to be here today. Thank you for having us. We value our partnership with NEHA. This has been uh, months in the works. We're very excited about it. We're hoping that it's going to be a part of an ongoing series and a great continuing relationship here. Um, for this first webinar, we just wanted to kind of talk about some of the basics of on-site wastewater treatment. What is it and where you can go for information. Uh, NEHA is a resource, but we wanted to let you know that NAURA is a resource. We have a lot of expertise and information that may be uh, available to everybody. So just going to go through a little bit of an introduction. Uh, this is our agenda for this webinar. I'm going to talk a little bit about the an intro to NARA and the on-site industry and who we cover. Uh, Dr. Hawkins is going to talk about the basics of on-site wastewater treatment. Uh, Dr. Lazor is going to talk about some upcoming NARA and NEHA events and additional resources, and I'll help out at the end there, and then we'll get into questions. Our goal is to leave five to ten minutes of the of this webinar at the end for questions. But meanwhile, if you do have some, please put them into the chat. So well, you saw our pictures earlier, but this is uh, this is the speakers from today. So first, just want to talk a little bit about NAURA. NAURA is a national organization. Uh, we have about 5,500 members representing 28 states across the country, 23 affiliates. Uh, we have a New England chapter, which covers the six New England states. So those um, those members are made up of all different sectors of the industry. Now we're prides ourselves on being the largest organization in the country that supports our that supports the on-site wastewater industry. We do have interest uh, from um, for our Canadian friends as well as some other countries as well. But right now, all our affiliates are in the U.S. 
We represent all segments of the on-site wastewater industry. These, these six categories here are our primary members, contractors, who could also be installers of systems, service providers, designers, engineers, soil, soil scientists, uh, regulators, whether it be um, local, county, or state, or federal, academics, and manufacturers. And the way the NARA board is structured as well, too, these six categories, we have two representatives from each of these categories who represent uh, NARA board. The, uh, just a couple of slides here about NARA. Our mission is to strengthen and promote the on-site decentralized wastewater industry. We know that we are 25 to 30% of the market. Um, although funding wise, that funding is not equitable that comes to our industry. So NARA is working to try to get what we can as well too, to our members and to the public uh, for the on-site industry. Through various committees, we implement best management practices we have education committee, tech practices committees, comes up with standards, guidelines uh, that we use for the industry. Through, uh, and we're also trying to achieve greater public awareness for on-site. Uh, there are some tools that we'll hear about a little bit later today that we've recently developed that are good for homeowners as well as regulators to just increase the knowledge and the awareness of on-site systems in their environmental and public health benefits. So some of our core activities, uh, advocacy, we are, oh, it looks like the poll popped up there. That's great. Uh, we are a 501c6, which means that we can lobby. So we do have a um, part-time lobbyist in DC who does some work for, for NARA in our membership. Um, we've made some great inroads the last couple of years. Uh, there are some decentralized grant programs through USDA and EPA that will be coming about uh, that are providing providing grants and low interest loans uh, for, for on-site systems repairs and replacements. One of the key things that we've been working on is uh, the census question. There used to be a census question, and I believe Dr. Hawkins will talk about whether you're on SOAR or you're on septic. There was a question, I think it disappeared in the early 1990s, uh, but working through our EPA partnership, we have been able to reinstate that question. So I believe it'll be showing up in the 2025 or 2026 American Community Survey. Uh, so we're hoping that that gives us more accurate numbers as far as the percentage of on-site in the country. Our partnerships, NEHA is one of our key partners. We also work with many other partners. Uh, our EPA MOU partnership, I believe is up to 25 or so members now, organizations. Uh, NEHA and NARA, I believe were one of the original members of the partnership back in early 2000s. We are working on research. We conducted a survey several years ago, I think it was 2021 with Baylor University uh, on the industry and what the needs are. Uh, we are in the process of getting that information finalized. This would be a great document to help document where we have uh, needs in policy, technical education, and with that, um, potential funding that can line up with that. And lastly, this kind of leads into our presentation here, training and education. This is one of our biggest um, umbrellas that we have in the organization. Uh, we have a national conference that rotates around the country every year, similar to how NIHA does. Uh, we have online training, self-paced training that people can take whenever uh, and come back and continue and get their continuing education credits. Uh, and we do in-person training. Uh, not as much in-person training lately. The online has taken place of that, but the conference and we have specialty workshops that we do as well. Oops. There we go. With that, I was going to turn it over to Dr. Hawkins for some on-site wastewater treatment basics. Gary? Thanks, Tom. Um, so like Tom said in the introduction, I just want to go through a couple of slides and, and just talk about a little bit about on-site wastewater treatment, the basics. Um, and I know the poll popped up and, and, and unfortunately we don't see the results, but I just want to go through some of the basics of wastewater and on-site wastewater and see how it goes. So so there's the poll. Um, so it looks like it's about a 30% split or 33% split. So some of this stuff will be really basic um, and hopefully you'll find something in here that you can then take back to your county um, as you as we go forward today. So I just want to go over some of the system basics. Um, what's the tank, where it is, distribution systems, 
such as that and, and where they play into the whole management of this on-site wastewater. We'll look at a wastewater treatment plant versus septic and, and how do those two sort of mimic each other um, and how they play together and, and how they look um, compared to each other. Talk about some of the benefits of on-site wastewater treatment and then look at how do we protect that system that's in our backyard, front yard, side yard, or wherever it's located. And then as part of that maintenance side, we'll go into some of the flushable and non-flushable um, items. Some of the common names that, and you can see them there, and I won't read them all off, but depending on where we are across the country, you may see all of these names. You may hear some of them. You may never hear some of these. So, And we've talked about it before amongst Tom, myself, Andy, that some of these are really specific to certain states, but these are some of the names you may see um, across. Typical ones we'll see as septic systems or decentralized, but you may see some of these others. Okay, Tom. So just kind of what is the septic system? So one, there you see it, it's the underground wastewater treatment system or structures. That includes the piping coming from the house. You see right there by the main line from the house, the septic tank itself. Um, and then you have the little gray box there is a distribution box. Um, and then you have the drain fill there with the filtration of the liquid going into the ground. So it's all typically underground system that, you know, a lot of times we don't even know they're there. Um, but so they're that underground aspect of it. Commonly used in areas of, um, where centralized sewer is not available. Um, I live near Atlanta, and I know as Atlanta and these larger communities or cities are growing, the sewer system can't keep up with the expansion of cities. So a lot of times, typically we think of septic in, in rural areas, but you may have some suburban um, areas around larger communities, larger cities that may have and be on septic. And then the last one there is a combination of nature um, and proven technology. So you see the filtration side of it, the soil absorption and purification, the bacteria, the soil itself is that natural technology, if you want to call it technology, but it's that nature aspect of it that the bacteria degrades and breaks down some more of the organic matter, the nitrogen removal, the phosphorus removal, and such as that, such as that. And then the technology itself is the tank and the distribution systems and how that all works together. Okay, Tom. And so, and then this picture here shows another kind of typical system. Um, this is, this image is from EPA, um, as you see there, but typically it's going to be your tank and the distribution system. And then the soil, like I mentioned earlier, is a big part of that cleaning process of this wastewater once it um, is treated in the tank and gets out into the distribution system. And a lot of these images we'll use are from EPA and they may be from some other sources. And as you see there, we don't, as NARA doesn't um, endorse any of these companies, but we're just using their images because they show really good pictures of what we're trying to demonstrate today. So the tank itself, um, this is a two chamber tank or two compartment tank in your state or county. It may be one or the other, um, but typically, and, and it is a watertight cham um, tank with, like I said, one or two chambers or compartments. Typically they're made of concrete, but they can be made of fiberglass, PVC, plastic. And they, a lot of times, um, in most cases, will receive both black water and gray water. And I'll talk a little bit more about black and gray water here in just a few minutes. And the process within the tank is we get the settling um, of the sludge, the heavier materials. There you see the brown on the bottom. And the scum are the, the floatables, the fat soils and greases and things like that that do actually get flushed down the drain or whatnot. They will, they'll float to the top, and we get that bluish area in the middle, which is still wastewater, but the bacteria does a lot of the breakdown of those organic materials right here in that middle section. Typical tank sizes are going to range from about 1,000 gallons um, for smaller houses up to 2,500 gallons. If you have a larger house um, or a, maybe even a small business would have that larger tank size. And when we design these systems, we design them on a number of bedrooms. And I always ask, you know, why bedrooms and not bathrooms? But 
bedrooms is going to give us a better indication of how many people live in that house. And based on which state you're in and in which county, that number of um, gallons per day going into the system could change, but it's all typically based on number of bedrooms. And then again, state regulations, like I mentioned on the last slide, it's going to really dictate if you have a one compartment or a one chamber tank versus a two chamber tank. Um, but that's that's going to be a little bit state specific. So I want to switch a little bit of gears. Um, so we've talked about the tank and the tank takes the um, wastewater itself um, from the house or the business and actually does some of the settling, some of the initial treatment um, that anaerobic bacteria breaks some of that down. Once it leaves the tank, it'll go into a leach field or a drain field. So you see the pictures there. Um, the um, there the chamber system as it's listed, but typically we'll have trenches, and then those trenches will have one of these typical type of situations in it. And all states might not have all of these, um, but some of the more common ones is pipe and gravel, which is the left hand picture where the trench is filled up with a, a couple inches of gravel. The pipe is laid in there and a couple inches of gravel laid on top of that pipe. And so as the wastewater goes down, it'll filter out into that gravel. Um, and then that will then infiltrate down into the ground. The chamber system um, is what you see there in that middle picture, that picture on the left. Chamber is basically just an arch. And I'll show you some pictures of these um, real quick on, on the next couple of slides. But the chamber accepts that wastewater. It's kind of a void area and it just fills up. Alternative gravel is more of the polystyrene wrapped in a netting material, and it's supposed to mimic the pipe and gravel situation. Again, you'll, we'll see that in just a second. Some states will have what they call stacked pipe. Um, I know we do here in Georgia, but it's not common across the country. Um, but it's just a four inches PVC pipe or, or ADS pipe um, put together. Um, combined treatment and dispersal is a way of actually housing bacteria within the treatment mechanism that does a lot of the treatment itself, and then it disperses that liquid out into the soil. Drip dispersal is drip irrigation. That's used where there's um, kind of a restrictive layer and some special is, um, situations where drip is a lot better than and putting a lot of liquid out there with these other systems and the mound systems are used where we have a restrictive layer a water layer a water table close to the surface and so again the, the purpose of the leach field is to take the liquid from the septic tank itself and then put it out into the environment where the soil can then be that tertiary treatment process the bacteria and the absorption onto the soil particles themselves can actually continue to clean that water. So the next couple of slides again is just kind of a cross section. These are some boxes we made um, that just show a cross section of these different leach field systems I showed you earlier. So this is just pipe and gravel. So you see the four inch pipe there in the middle of a gravel bed. The liquid comes in and infiltrates down. This is a chamber system with the kind of the void area there. Okay, Tom. Um, this is that alternative gravel with the polystyrene where the, it's supposed to mimic um, pipe and gravel there. And you can kind of see that. This is the stack system where it's the four inch pipe. And then typically you'll have nine, 11 or 13 pieces there to accept that water and then let it infiltrate. And then this is one of the combined treatment and dispersal systems where the liquid would come in, it gets caught in that matrix, it does some treatment, and then it flows out into the sand and then further down on into the soil profile itself. And then the last two, um, the one on the left is a drip system, again, where we have a restrictive layer pretty close to the surface or some other special um, situations where drip, putting out just a little bit of water, um, at a time will allow that water to infiltrate. And on the right, if we have a close groundwater table or a restrictive layer to the surface, we have to actually build that system up and then put a dispersal system in it. One of the other things we're not going to really talk about much today, and I know next um, the next webinar, Allison and um, Chris will talk a little bit more about it, is advanced treatment. And so advanced treatment is combining a lot of aeration within the tank, as you see there on the left, 
And so what that does is puts the air in there and it causes that bacteria to actually grow and break down that organic matter a lot faster. And so you get a little bit cleaner product going out the output. Another me method there on the right is the sand filter septic system where liquid's pumped up to the top of a sand filter. It infiltrates down, and as it the water infiltrates down, the bacteria that's on the bacteria, I mean, on the sand particles and in that sand filter actually treats that water. And as you see, it goes back to the tank and can get recirculated back up into the sand filter. And then a certain portion of that's um, pushed out to the distribution systems like we looked at earlier. So I kind of want to just go through a little bit of how, and I always get a question about municipal wastewater versus um, septic systems. And so on a municipal wastewater treatment system, if you've ever, or plant, if you've ever been to one, you know, on the right-hand side there in the yellow box, the grit and screen. So all the wastewater will come into the plant. It gets screened out. So those things that don't break down through the turbulence of moving it through the system to the wastewater treatment plant are screened out. So that's your flushable wipes. That's those things that don't break down very easily are screened out. They'll then go over to the primary settling basins where air is introduced into the system. The bacteria is grown, basically. That bacteria will break down those smaller particles of organic matter, convert them over carbon dioxide and water and some other factors. From there, it'll go into the round, the secondary clarifier, the round tanks there. And there, the sludge will start settling. And at the top, the cleaner water, let me put it that way, will actually start um, flowing over the top of those basins, or they're designed to flow over the top of those basins. From there, the sludge will be taken to, you see the anaerobic digesters there, to break that organic matter down further and form methane. And then the clear liquid out of the secondary clarifiers will go typically through either the bioreactors you see there, or um, there'll be a chlorination process in there to kill any pathogens. And then from typically wastewater treatment plants, that will go back out um, to a water body, be it a river like you see there in the upper left-hand corner, to a lake. And then some wastewater treatment plants will use what they call a land application system. So that liquid will actually be sprayed out onto pasture land or forest land or something like that to finally dispose of it. So I always get the question, um, and Tom, you can go on to the next one. The ne okay. And so how does that then compare to the septic systems that we have at our house and, and we're talking about today? Well, everything within the yellow box there occurs within the septic tank itself. So we get the settling, we get the screening, we get the separation of the solids and the scum, we get the anaerobic the bacteria actually working in there to break that organic matter down. Once that occurs, it'll go out to the blue box on the wastewater treatment plant or the dispersal system um, on the inset there of the septic system where that liquid will then infiltrate into the ground. And like I talked about earlier, the bacteria in the soil, the soil itself will absorb some of the, the minerals and such as that. And that's where we get the final treatment. That can then infiltrate down like we saw in some of the other pictures into groundwater and at that point it can daylight quote unquote back out to our creeks and rivers and streams but though that's how they kind of compare um with the two a wastewater treatment plant and a septic system okay tom and so i mentioned a little bit ago gray water versus black water uh, and so these are just kind of some descriptions so gray, gray water is going to be that bath the bathroom sinks the washing machines those things that typically will not have organic matter associated with them. Black water, on the other hand, is those things that will have organic matter associated with it. So toilets obviously has organic matter. Dishwashers will have a lot of the potentially the food scraps and such as that, which is that organic matter. And then kitchen drains will have that organic matter. So that's why we and call them two different kind of waters. And as we start looking at septic systems, especially if we start to have failures or whatnot, a lot of times we'll go back and start looking at these typical amounts of water we use in a household and are these out of out of whack for the back lack of a better term 
um, to see if we're using more water or putting more water into that tank, um, into the septic system to try to figure out if we're having failures and where that occurs. So these are just some typical numbers you might see. And so where is the systems typically located? I mean, you can see it there. Typically, rule of thumb, if you want to call it that, is three to 10 feet away from the house is where the septic tank's going to be. Typically, these systems are gravity fed. So you want it as close to the house as possible, but you don't want it right up under the house, obviously. So that water will run into the septic tank itself. Typically, it's going to be, and I'll, you'll see there the backyard. I mean, I've seen them in the front yard, side yards, wherever, but wherever there's available space uh, for that septic system. The tank itself is typically going to be about a five by eight foot box that's going to be typically three to four, maybe even five feet deep to accommodate that thousand to 2,500 gallons um, that we showed earlier. And that could actually be two or three tanks put together in combination. Um, and then again, regulations from state to state, it's going to really differ. If you see there on that picture um, in the right hand side, that groundwater well, typically we want septic systems to be downstream of our wells. Um, and then the distance between that septic system and the groundwater well is going to vary from state to state. Typically, it's going to be about 50 to 100 feet. But again, it could change from state to state. What are some of the benefits then of septic system? It's highly efficient, self-contained. So again, we've talked about it. The tank itself is air, uh, watertight. It's a box itself. The distribution system is right there, all contained within itself. It's typically going to be underground. So a lot of folks really don't know where or if they even have septic systems. And I'll show you kind of how we can see if we are on septic here in a minute or two. Simple in design, again, it's a tank, anaerobic digestion, and then basically spread that liquid out underground and let the soil do its work. Doesn't require miles and miles of sewer lines. I mentioned earlier that when, as these larger cities or cities start to expand, the sewer system lines may not move as fast as neighborhoods. And so these are easy ways to have wastewater treatment on site without having to move those sewer lines out there at a pretty high cost. And it's optimal way um, way to manage that household waste. Again, it's right there and typically the backyard, front yard, side yard, and all that waste goes into a box that's treated. So the next couple of slides, I want to kind of talk about some of the ways to protect our septic system and how do we maintain them. So again, um, the first one there is, you know, don't put heavy things on top of our tanks. Obviously, we don't have 50 ton weights we haul, haul around. But if you're putting in a patio in the backyard or a swimming pool or anything that's going to require heavy trucks like concrete trucks, um, um, cement trucks, anything hauling heavy objects, if they ride over that tank, those tanks are designed to take a little bit of weight, but not those heavy, heavy loads. And if that tank cracks, then the whole system's compromised because you're going to get a lot more water in it. And so we just want to keep any of those heavy type items off of it. The other side of it there on the right hand side of the picture is we don't want to flush or pour those non biodegradable materials or chemicals down into the drain. So you see some examples there and I'll show you a few on the next slide, I think. But we don't want to put anything in that tank that the anaerobic bacteria can't break down very easily. OK, Tom. And so this slide just shows some of those other non um, flushable items. I mean, you see them all there. The, the typical things um, that we don't want to put down. In our, in our septic system, and really on that hand, really into the municipal system, because these things don't break down very fast. They take up a lot of space, um, especially in the tank, and they don't degrade um, very fast if they degrade at all. And then on the right hand, bottom right hand corner, fats, oils, and greases. I know we're going to cook with oils and fats a little bit, um, and that little bit that's left on our dishes when we wash them off is such as I mean, it's going to get down into our septic systems, but we don't want to pour the bacon grease or the cooking oil or whatnot down the drain. Um, that needs to go in the trash can once it's cool or some other place, but we definitely don't need to pour it down the drain. 
And and one of the things to remember is basically the toilet's a toilet um, to receive um, waste material like that, but it's not a trash can. So, you know, typically if there's those non-flushables we just talked about, if you can throw them in the trash can, then that goes out into the larger trash can, into the landfill, and just use the toilet for the things I'll show you on the next slide or so. And so here's the things that we typically would say you need to flush down the toilet. And these are the four, the pee, the poop, the puke, and the toilet paper. So if it's the four P's, you can put it in the toilet. Um, those others will flush down, but these are probably the things you need to really maintain to, to put flush down the drain. And then you see the picture there on the right. Basically, what goes down the drain should be what comes out of us. Just a little bit more on the tank protection. You know, if we have trees or, or such as that where the roots are growing into the tank or the distribution system, those roots will get into that liquid source. They'll they'll fill it up, especially the pipelines, um, and that will stop and block any water from moving from the tank to the distribution system, as you see there, or from the house to the tank. So we want to try to keep any really deep rooted plants away from that septic system, including the tank and the distribution. And then on the right hand picture is a garbage disposal. Garbage disposals, I mean, I know some folks like to use them, um, but we would almost suggest not putting a um, garbage disposal on a septic tank with that extra organic matter going in there. And I won't go through the whole spew of it today, but um, the more organic matter we put in that tank, the the worse the, um, and the more active the anaerobic bacteria. And then basically it becomes a really upset uh, stomach. So a thousand, 1500 gallon stomach. And so we don't wanna put any extra material in there. If you want to, and you have customers or clients that um, really, really, really just want a garbage disposal. You need to, and especially if you can do it on the design side, let the engineers or whoever know so they can design properly the a size tank to deal with that. But typically we want to keep those away from septic systems. So from pumping the tank um, is another maintenance side. Typically we need to maintain these systems um, we don't want those solids to build up and, and consume a lot of that space. We don't want a lot of that scum to build up and consume a lot of that space. So we want to leave most of the space within the tank itself for the, the breakdown of those products. And so pumping the tank out every so often, and, and on a couple of slides from now, I'll show you kind of a rule of thumb, um, but we need to keep those out. And then the third bullet there, the solids will eventually clog up. So if we let the scum or the sludge build up in the tank. As that goes out, um, it potentially can go out into the pipes. And once the pipes are clogged up, then there's a major failure within that system. So keeping that tank maintained and pumped out every so often is a good idea. And so this slide just kind of, I mean, this is one we use here in Georgia and, and I'm expecting most other states would have a similar type slide. But this is just kind of a rule of thumb, and it's really, really rule of thumb um, as to how many years to pump the tank. And so if you look at it there, let's say a 1,500-gallon tank with three to four people in the house, you fall right into that three to five-year pump-out time. Um, I always tell folks when I do workshops like this, if you have grandma living in a house by herself for some reason, um, with a 2,500-gallon tank, she may not need to pump it out, but every 32 years. But if you live on campus somewhere or near campus and you have a fraternity house, you might need to pump it out every six months. So it just really depends on number of bedrooms and how often that system's used. And so I mentioned a little bit ago, um, you know, how do we know if we're on sewer or if we're on septic? A lot of times we don't know if there's a septic system in the backyard or the side yard if you just walk up to a property. But for a homeowner, if they have this on their bill, sewer base charge or in sewer charge, they are on sewer. If typically you don't have that on a water bill, then you're on septic. So that's just a one kind of really quick way for a homeowner to know if they're on sewer or on septic. <clears throat> And then some signs of malfunction um, of the sewer system itself. I mean, if you have some cave-ins like this where 
some reason that that may um, be a pipeline that broke and, and was running out. It could be a tank that got crushed some kind of way or the tank lid that got crushed. So that left picture is where it might have fell in. On the right hand side there is, is a failure of a septic system. And then the liquid in the distribution system or the tank is actually coming up to the surface. So if you see that, that's, that's a good indication you may be having a malfunction um, of your septic system and you can see where they was riding through it. So again, just some other issues that we can see and a way to see if the system's malfunctioning. Okay, Tom. And so Tom, I'll turn it back over to you and Mr. Andy, or Dr. LaRouche. Thanks, Gary. Yeah, so I'd like to uh, share now uh, some other, uh, I think, really good uh, events that you can take advantage of. Next slide, Tom. Yeah, so the the second part of the series is uh, sewage disposal, the priority item that you may be overlooking. This is on June 11th, and this is going to build on today's webinar and go into you know more detail on sewage systems, particularly dealing with uh, you know the rural food and service. Uh, facilities and again taking into account the food code and provide you additional information on how to make an evaluation but also you know how do you solve some of the issues that that these uh, businesses would be having so again uh, another opportunity to encourage you to take advantage of so this webinar is going to be taught by two people that have a wealth of experience in on-site systems. Both are registered environmental health specialists. Allison Blodig would, uh, you know, again, has been involved with the industry for many, many years. And she is also the current president of NAURA. And then Chris LeClaire, again, uh, a lot of experience out in the counties. And uh, <clears throat> he is also serving as our Vice President of NAURA. So again, a wealth of information, I think very informative webinar opportunity for you. And then we also have a pre-conference workshop. And this is, of course, at the uh, NEHA conference coming up in July in Pittsburgh. And it's going to build on both the webinars and go into more detail on systems and management. And uh, again, another great opportunity. This is a, a four-hour workshop. And again, that's on the pre-conference. So that's on Monday, the July 15th, another great opportunity that we hope you take advantage of. And again, what that's going to do and go into more detail than today's webinar, building on, you know, it's little basics plus, if you will, okay, get into more of the meat of such things as, you know, the treatment, some of the nutrients, uh, the contaminants of emerging concern those types of things, uh, alternative systems, uh, some of the mounds, the ATUs. So it's gonna be more in-depth overview of, of on-site systems. And then we'll talk about some additional resources as well. And uh, Gary and I will be presenting that workshop. So uh, we're both looking forward to this. And I think we'd be a great opportunity to learn more about on-site systems and empower you to go back to your uh, counties, uh, wherever, and be able to share that information. So some additional resources from now are we, we want to talk about. These include, well, first off, there's the EPA Septic Smart Program. And if you're not familiar with this, this is a really uh, valuable resource. Uh, EPA has done a lot of great work putting together uh, a nice portfolio of different types of resources. These include uh, fact sheets, brochures, videos, some of them are in Spanish as well. And uh, so take advantage of that. They even have, uh, again, this this would be literature that you could hand out uh, to or videos that you could uh, provide to homeowners in your area. So a great resource, and we encourage you to take advantage of that. Okay. All right. And then other opportunities. So three main uh, aspects, and that's our online Learning Academy, uh, our, our conference, and then our homeowner materials. And I'll go through these each individually. So here we have, uh, I think, a really nice portfolio, a little over 60 courses. A great, again, a great opportunity to pick up 
additional information on specific aspects of on-site. Again, design courses, uh, installer courses, uh, again, you know, troubleshooting types of things, uh, even a course called A to Z. Uh, these are typically, you know, one to four hours, although there is, you know, uh, the A to Z, if you combined all those sections, that's about eight hours of, of uh, you know, learning opportunities. So again, these are uh, available both to members and non-members. And so a really uh, good portfolio. And we're adding courses uh, as we go along. And then this is the example of our recent uh, development of a homeowner uh, education uh, online. And this is, we have a course for this. Uh, again, this was funded through RCAP, another now a partner. And again, a really, really nice uh, packaged homeowner education opportunity. And then uh, the next slide shows a companion uh, homeowner guide that you can see here, the QR code or the link there. And uh, again, just kind of, again, companion guide to the, the online course. So another great resource. And then I want to mention, as Tom mentioned earlier, we have our annual conferences. And uh, this year it's going to be in uh, Spokane, Washington in October. And then again, we usually plan out a couple of years in advance. The uh, following year is in Cleveland. And then in 2026, it'll be in Denver. And next slide. And this is a great opportunity uh, to take advantage of of uh, industry members, regulators, uh, educators. It's an opportunity to you know hear about some of the latest technology, some case studies that have been done, students that have done research and presenting posters, whatever the case may be, but also you know being able to network with that community, but also to to see some of this technology, you know, hands on, if you will, at, at our expo. So again, a great uh, learning opportunity. And then in conjunction with that, uh, we offer several field trips uh, during the uh, annual conference. And these field trips are, again, another great way to see hands-on this technology. So we select uh, sites that uh, will offer, you know, opportunities to learn about new technologies, maybe challenging locations, talk to the individuals, you know, how did they, uh, you know, what was the rationale behind you know, the system or the technology that they worked on, uh, but also just, uh, you know, hearing questions from other attendees. And so it's it's another great networking and learning opportunity. But then we also have some fun. Uh, you get to try out your uh, backhoe uh, operating skills here with uh, what we call the backhoe rodeo, but it's a uh, rodeo, but it's a, it's a great uh, uh, learning opportunity and, and again, hands-on type of uh, activities to be able to take advantage of. So Tom, I'll turn it back over to you. Okay, thanks. Thanks, Andy. And I guess one other thing to emphasize with the with the um, the conference, uh, we know as health professionals and the NEHA conference, there's many, many different tracks and it's hard to decide, you know, which sessions and tracks to go in. Um, so if you're looking for something that's just on-site wastewater, you know, our conference is just all on-site wastewater. We have several tracks of it, but it's just on-site wastewater. So with that, I'd like to thank, you know, uh, the other gentlemen on this call. Um, we, here is our contact information. Uh, you can reach us um, by that email down below. A QR code will take you to our homepage. Uh, the website address is down below as well, too. Uh, we are a national organization. Um, I am based out of Massachusetts, but we are a national organization. And I guess with that, Christy, um, if we have any questions or anything in the chat, I think we have time to handle some. We do, Gary. Thank you. So first of all, I'd like to mention that wonderful Jordan, our marketing manager, is dropping in the chat the link to the pre-conference at the AEC. So everyone will have access to that. We do have a question and it's from an individual who is saying they're looking forward to the pre-conference in Pittsburgh. And can you incorporate the use of AI of the industry as well? Are you seeing any work with AI in what you're doing currently? Um, Christy, if you don't mind, and I don't know if Roy can talk, but 
what what kind of things are you thinking about, Roy, with AI? Are you talking about like the septic system monitoring systems where it kind of tells us we're, if we're overusing water? Um, are you talking about water usage within the house and then monitoring that? Are you talking about infiltration rates? So I don't know, like I said, I don't know if Roy, if you can type that in, Roy, or whatnot, but um, I think Andy and I may be able to incorporate some of that. Um, it just depends on kind of what AI you're thinking about, because um, I have know some of the professors I'm working with here um, have some of the that automated kind of information that they're working with to try to monitor septic systems itself. And Andy, uh, you may be working with AI a little bit more than I am. Well, actually, just very superficially, if you will, just beginning to. Um, and a few of our industry folks are more asking questions about the utility uh, of it to them. So we're, I think we're at the very beginning stages. Looks okay. like AI is going to be everywhere, whether we like it or not. I think so. Um, and we'll give Roy some time if he can drop in the chat. Uh, some more information so we can address that question a little further. Another question is, you showed the pictures of when there was something going on in the system, like the one that you saw the water above the grass. What is the next steps on that? Is that up to the homeowner or how does that get resolved? I can, I'll give it a shot and then Andy, you and uh, Tom can hop in. Um, I think there's a couple of different things that can be done there. One, you notice it's there. So I think a lot of times it goes back to, one, have you increased your water usage? So I showed that one chart of typical water usage in the household. So have for some reason you increased your water usage and then the system may not be able to handle that water usage. Um, I know I went out to one lady's house and and she had an issue that sort of looked like that. And I asked her why. And she said her son and, and his family or daughter and his, her family had moved in. So their water consumption going into that tank had just about doubled, if not more than double. And that issue started. So first thing is to figure out, are you really overusing water or do you have a leak in your system somewhere? So a little bit of water a little drip, a little um, extra water going into the toilet or whatnot over a day, over a week, over a month, over a year will cause the system to have a lot more water than it is used to, and it can occur to that. If that doesn't happen and you're not overusing water, you haven't been using a lot more, your leaks are not leaking, quote unquote, um, the next step would be to figure out why. And at that point, either work with the health specialist in your counties, you guys, or a homeowner could call a septic system um, installer or whatnot to come out and look at it. But then that may then revert back to you guys, especially if you write permits or whatnot to either modify the system or write new permits for a new system. So Andy and Tom, is it different in your states than here in Georgia like that? Well, I'll just add to what you said, because, you know, the water use obviously can, as you said, describe, you know, can play a role. The other thing is, you know, that one picture where the water is surfacing, you know, it it, it showed indications where people driving over the, the drain field. And of course, when you drive over a drain field, you're compacting that soil and that uh, can uh, actually cause uh, issues where the water won't percolate properly. And, and if they drive over it, they, they might even crush something. It might be a crushed pipe. Or, uh, you know, on probably the worst case scenario is that maybe it's a combination of things, plus the, the, the drain field itself is, is pretty much used its useful life. And so the soil pores are getting clogged with the biomat and things like that. And you may get that surfacing. So, you know, it's, it's a little bit sometimes when you go out and you see these things, a little bit of kind of uh, taking more of a for, forensic approach, trying to figure out exactly why, as Gary said, but it, the reasons could be multiple. Um, so if a, it, but if a, you know, drain field soil gets clogged where it can no longer take water and it's surfacing or backing up in the house, and that basically you need to replace that drain field and go to another area on that piece of property and, and put in a new dispersal system. 
Okay, we have a couple more questions and then we can circle back to Roy and the AI questions. Here's a question that was uh, submitted. When a tank gets pumped out, does the entire 1000 gallons get pumped out? And if so, is there any treatment that gets added back to the bottom of the clean tank? So, Andy, you want to start off with that one, or you want me to start off with? Yeah, it? no, I, I'll I'll take that. I'm happy to. Uh, so, yeah, when the uh, tank is pumped, the the total volume is pumped out. So that's including the the fats, oils, and grease on the surface, the clarified water, and, and all the solids. It's, there's no need to do any sort of treatment to that septic tank. If you if you remove that total volume, then that is the treatment. That's what you're you're uh, looking to do. And just to add to that, Chrissy, a little bit, if you don't mind, I mean, a lot of times, like Andy said, you take all that volume out of the tank. Well, it's going to take a little bit of time for that to get the, the tank to fill back up before it starts going into your distribution system. And, and my typical saying when I talk to homeowners is if you have standard conditions in your house, if your system's working correctly, your, system, your tank's going to work correctly. You've got the bacteria there to break that waste product down. So as it fills that thousand gallons back up, which is going to take a couple of days, if not a week or so, the bacteria are there to start breaking that material down. Okay, can I go back to the question? I wasn't clear of, so when you pump all that out, where do you pump it? Does it go into the leach, leach field or where does it go when you no. pump it out? Oh, that's a, no, that's a good question and actually a very timely question. Uh, so it, it's pumped, you'll have, a, pumping trucks who come around, uh, they'll pump it out and they'll take it in, they'll, they'll take it into a big truck. So they'll have a hose. And I think uh, Gary had a picture of someone servicing it. And they'll take that uh, to probably a regional wastewater treatment plant. You know, there are some, so that's called septage. So there may be some just septage only treatment facilities, but for the most part, a municipal wastewater treatment system has a place where you can deposit that and the pumper will do that. And I think the question also was talking about once it's pumped, you know, do I have to add anything? You hear some of these stories that you need to seed it, you need to put something in there. And that, what Gary said, is true. It's not necessary. Okay. Moving on. What type of issues will occur if the septic system is too close to the well? And do you hear me take that one and you fill in? How's that? Go ahead. We'll, we'll share this one. Um, I mean, if the septic system is too close to the well, typically, if your septic system is working properly, if the, the breakdown, the initial breakdown is occurring in the tank and your distribution system is working properly, you generally will not have any problem and you shouldn't have any problem with the well. Um, the bacteria in the soil is going to continue to break that waste water down. Um, the some of the minerals, the phosphorus, the other minerals may attach to the soil particles. So by the time the water gets down to, especially if your well is in a deeper aquifer, that water is going to be clean. So you generally won't have a problem with the well. Now, with that being said, if you have a shallow well, mm -hmm. if the distribution system's not working properly, if the well is downstream of the septic system, then you potentially could have bacteria, nitrates, or other um, things that are very aqueous in the um, wastewater system, the septic system could get into the well. But again, if you've got a deeper well, separate at least by aquifer from your septic system, you generally will not have any problem. Andy, can you add to that? Well, you, you covered it well. I just said, yeah, it really depends upon the well. Uh, so again, as Gary said, if it's in a you know deeper confined aquifer, then then you have a level of uh, protection. But if it's a shallow well, then yes, you're at risk of contamination. And that's why, you know, it's important for well owners to test annually for for the coliform bacteria, E. coli, and nitrates because those are indicators indicators of some sort of contamination from uh, animal waste, whether it be insects, pets, wildlife, or, or human sewage. So without testing, you know, well and septic owners are, are, are you know, they don't know. And if it's an older well and it's shallow, then absolutely they need to test. And if they 
come the results come back, then they then they need to do some treatment. Okay. Do you want to circle back around to Roy's question regarding AI? And then we have a few more questions after that. Uh, we have about five minutes more to go and hopefully we can get through these questions. Well, I saw Roy's um, response, so I've got it marked down here, um, or at least copied over to a Word document, so me and Andy can talk about it um, okay. and figure out how we can potentially integrate that in. So, yeah, I've got it. Thank you, Ms. Christie. Wonderful. Now, the next question is regarding research, and if there's been any research on the bacteria, and if it has reached groundwater, the water table, for instance, how far will the bacteria travel through the soil or can it? So I'll, I'll go ahead and give it a shot, Andy, and then you can add in if you don't mind. Um, there's, I couldn't tell you how much research has been done, but there's been a lot of research done on it. Now, a lot is very um, not precise, actually. But a lot of the bacteria that's in our wastewater system are more of the pathogenic bacteria that we have in our in our system the the bacteria in the soil itself will is more of an aerobic type system so it will kill some of the bacteria the pathogens that are in our body like our body temperature so once it gets out into the environment and it's not 98 degrees some of those pathogens will um die off and or be consumed by the bacteria in the soil itself Will those bacteria move through the soil itself? Yes, they can. Um, but typically, if you have an, a well-operating distribution system, well-maintained, and it's working properly, those bacteria will get, quote-unquote, filtered out prior to getting to the groundwater. So, Andy, you want to add to that? Not much to build on there, Gary, other than, you know, uh, if you look at different uh, state regulations, they probably require, you know, several feet of what's called vertical separation. So that's the distance, their depth of soil from the bottom of the drain field to some limiting layer, whether that's either rock or water table. So if you've got that three to four feet, uh, the earlier research is showing that's that's pretty much in most cases eliminating, you know, the pathogenic bacteria because, um, you know, bacteria does get trapped in the soil particles. And as Gary mentioned, you know, they, they're out competed by some of the other bacteria that's in the soil and such like that. So soil is a wonderful biofilter. And that's that's one of the pluses of on-site systems is that we we integrate, we take advantage of that, that soil uh, to do some of our treatment. Ah, so that goes right into our next question. <laughs> and this is, we have had the tank empty, but the contractor left the solids. How can I make sure they get all of it out, including solids and liquid. Tom, you want that one or? <laughs> uh, I mean, I would insist. I mean, the main the main reason why you're pumping the tank is so the solids don't build up mm. too much to go out into the drain field. So if they're leaving behind the solids, they're really not helping you out much. And Christy, on that note, I mean, I know when my tank's pumped, I always like to go out there and watch them, or at least stay out of their way, but watch them. Um, but for me, it's kind of interesting to watch them, so. I bet. So I will end with this last question. And any other questions that come in the chat, gentlemen, I will forward them to you. And if you could answer those, and then when we send out the communication that this recorded video is up on our YouTube channel, we will include the answers to those questions. So this one's a quick one. It says, is the NEHA pre-conference session geared towards all levels of septic knowledge? or a certain group, such as we did in our poll, beginner, intermediate, or advanced? Um, go ahead, Andy. Well, I was gonna say, you know, that's a that's a great question. In, in, in the four hours, I think we're certainly gonna be building on a good bit of what we've talked about today. So more details of each of these different aspects. So I would say it's probably geared more, uh, well, it's gonna be, in, uh, beginner plus probably the more of the intermediate level uh, although I think anybody that uh, is you know attends whatever their knowledge level they'll, they'll certainly get something out of it because again we're going to try to share uh, some of the material that we already use for our a to, what we call a to z core so it's going more into detail on things and then Gary and I will be also, also be able to share uh, some other information that we we 
know about that's, you know, some, maybe some new trends or some latest research, whatever the case may be. Okay, gentlemen, that is all the time we have for today. We at NEHA, we thank you for sharing your expertise and your gift of time. And to our attendees, your feedback is very important to us. And we encourage you to fill out the short survey that you will receive at the end of this webinar, because that helps us to sustain our mission, which is to build, sustain, and empower an effective environmental workforce. Again, we thank all of you for attending, and especially our presenters. And I wish you a good rest of your day.